Welcome to the Open Newsroom, brought to you by the Good Information Project. I'm Sinead O'Carroll, the editor of the journal, and this is a new initiative launched by us to open a dialogue with our audience around big issues. We want to find out what questions you'd like answered and hopefully equip you with the skills to seek out good information on certain topics. This month, we are looking at the idea of a united Ireland, asking the big question about what a shared island could look like. The time seems right to discuss these issues as unionists are raising fears over the border and Brexit. Michal Martin's 500 million euro shared island unit works to find new cross-border ideas. And Sinn Féin's friends in the US are placing ads in American papers saying United Ireland is near. I'll be joined for this open newsroom by Ronan Duffy and Grania Nia, who have be- both been writing about these issues for a number of years. And Grania has been writing about Brexit a lot for what probably seems like almost a decade now, which is kind of almost is a decade, Grania. Um, Ronan, as I said, you have been looking at this stuff for years. So we're going to start with you on the current situation. And there has been a lot of talk about border polls. And it's something that you've looked at as we were starting uh, this topic What is the current situation and when could we or will we see a border poll? And actually just explain to us what a border poll even is first. Yeah, I suppose kind of what I've been looking at is the idea that there will be referendums on the United Ireland and under what circumstances that might happen, when it might happen and how that's provided for within the Good Friday Agreement and within Irish and UK legislation, that kind of thing. And I suppose one of the things to to point out from the beginning is that, you know, we use the word border, border poll because, you know, it's perhaps a handy shorthand for what this kind of thing looked like, you know, but within the Good Friday Agreement, it doesn't use the term border poll. And it does actually, you know, some debate as to whether that is a terminology that, you know, should be talked about because the idea of a border is actually, you know, quite perhaps controversial in itself. But, but just to kind of go through how such a thing might, might happen within the Good Friday Agreement that, you know, everyone's familiar with and that, there is broad acceptance for among most people on you know both Ireland and across um, politics in the UK. Um, it is referenced within the Good Friday Agreement that um, they basically the idea of the consent theory is 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 allowed for in that it is up for the people of Northern Ireland to determine their future. And so currently that means that both governments, the Irish and the UK government, have to accept that it's the desire of the majority of the people in Northern Ireland to remain as part of the union. But it is also accepted within the Good Friday Agreement that should a majority of people um, feel otherwise and want to join United Ireland, there is a procedure within the Good Friday Agreement um, to have what what it describes as concurrent uh, determination on both um, on the island of Ireland to allow for for United Ireland. So in in theory, it kind of makes, makes it for uh, referendums on both sides of the border within the north and within the south that would allow for United Ireland and both governments would have to accept that. Now, so that's quite straightforward in theory that it could happen. Now, the actual, you know, completion of that in practice is a completely different ballgame altogether. Yeah, because obviously the, the politics of it really comes into play. And one of the questions then is, is an Irish government always going to push for a border poll or obliged to push for United Ireland even? Well, I suppose the Irish government isn't obliged to push for for this. I mean, we we we've kind of looked at this in the, in the past, and perhaps there's no legal obligation on the Irish government to work towards an Irish to work towards a unity referendum. But the argument goes there that there is a desire towards unity within the Irish constitution. I mean, previously, um, the Irish constitution this is before the Good Friday Agreement, the Irish constitution, um. So basically had a claim, a claim of ownership over Northern Ireland. It said that the Irish territory encompasses the entire island and its island. Now that was removed following the Good Friday Agreement. And it was essentially watered down into what you might say is an aspirational version. I think it says along the lines of it is the firm will of the Irish nation to unite all the people of, of the territory of the island. So that basically says, you know, the Irish constitution would seek for a united Ireland, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the Irish government has to work towards that. And um, so, so that's kind of where that kind of uh, balance lies, you might say. Yeah, and the, part of the Good Information Project in week one, which we're in of, of the first topic, is to try and set out the current situation so that we can start this dialogue with readers and get questions in from them about, OK, this is what's happening now. What what questions do you need answered so that you can partake in this conversation? Um, and part of that is 
what we're now hearing a lot of. We've called this uh, topic the shared island as well. It's 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 becoming as common to say shared island as it is probably to say United Ireland. Um, so, Gwani, you've been looking at what Michal Martin's shared island unit has been up to. Can you give just a, a brief uh, overlook to us all about what you found out when you've been examining it? Uh, yeah, the shared island unit is a civil servant powered group initiative within the Taoiseach's department that are looking at ways of cooperating between north and south in a practical kind of way. And uh, a couple of the things that they're doing is not only um, commissioning research into, into what could work north and south, but also speaking to different groups um, about kind of collaboration that have knowledge of their specific areas, I suppose, and how it could work better between north and south. Um, so that work has already begun on that that dialogue. There's a there's a 500 um, million euro uh, fund to fund this for the next five years. So this is the tip of the iceberg for what the kind of work it, it, it will be doing. But we have gotten a glimpse, I suppose, as, as um, opaque as the work that they're doing is from the outside at the moment, we have gotten a glimpse into what they're looking at. One of the things is fixing roads and transportation systems north and south. So that's greenways and, um, you know, motorways between north and south. Um, they're looking at an uh, education to be a key priority for them. So um, uh, we've been told that Minister Simon Harris is heavily engaged, heavily involved in trying to create links between North and South and then an all island research hub as well, which will help improve treatments for cancer patients and um, cyber security might be a, a big topic. Northern Ireland is a bit of a hub for that type of work. Uh, and that is some of the work that they're going to be looking at, uh, I suppose, strengthening ties, to use that phrase, um, to see if there can be better cooperation. So even if it doesn't lead to something like United Ireland, that you're just making an island work more efficiently overall. And that's basically what, what we know it's up to at the moment. But as it's very early stages. Grania, should we read in, into that five year time frame of the shared island unit in any way? Like, is that when Michal Martin and Fianna Fáil expect there to be a United Ireland, expect the work to be done? Or is it just things are generally done in five year uh, periods in Ireland? Yeah, it seems kind of like a, rather than a United Ireland or a more shared island uh, in five years time, that things would be revisited then. It would be given money for another five years. Um, or like the, the context might be completely different then, you know, in five years time, Brexit, will, the effects of Brexit might be a lot different. The political landscape in Northern Ireland might be a lot different. It's kind of, it doesn't make much sense, I would say, to plan further beyond that. The time frame we get for United Ireland is usually in our lifetime, which is obviously much longer than five years. Uh, I wouldn't read too much into it, but I think, um, the five, the funding and the five year gives it a bit of a structure, I suppose, to get things done in a certain amount of time um, rather than anything being finished in five years time. Yeah, in our lifetime, certainly the, the meaning of that or probably our own perceptions of what that is changed with Brexit. Um, I think that's probably a fair statement. In what ways have recent Brexit developments accelerated this even more? I'm thinking even from an editor's point of view, like the idea of having a talk around the United Ireland feels a lot more fraught because of those tensions, because what people in Northern Ireland are saying, particularly on the unionist and loyalist side. So you can kind of take us through the piece that you have written already for the Good Information Project about what Brexit has done for Northern Ireland and this conversation. Yeah, it um, Brexit happened and it split all kind of four parts of the United Kingdom. Um, but in Northern Ireland, it was more fraught because everything became a green or orange issue. Everything's a green or orange issue. And this kind of split it down, mostly those divides, but um, a little bit either side of it as well. The problem is that under the Good Friday Agreement and EU membership, the UK and Ireland had the same rules. So our Northern Ireland didn't really have to choose which to align with. 
and now under the protocol which was negotiated in Brussels without any elected members of Northern Ireland at the table to talk about how that region works and how its people live and um, even though they were listening to those concerns we have a protocol now that is designed for Northern Ireland rather than by Northern Ireland and it, in, in wanting to keep two very different um, communities and political viewpoints happy it doesn't work brilliantly in, in practice. Now that might change, we're only three months into um, drastic changes of trade so in, a, in, in three more months or even in a year's time things might have set, calmed down, they'll definitely be more calm than they are now but we just don't know at the moment how things are going to go because all these politically charged viewpoints about where Northern Ireland should be and where it should be going are playing into practicalities about how trucks should come into the country and go out, how checks should be carried out, um, you know, animal and plant safety and health checks. All these types of things are now coloured by politics, which makes it all very complicated. And Northern Ireland has to sort this out for itself now. There are discussions between the EU and the UK about how to make it run more smoothly, but I really don't know if they have the answer as to how Northern Ireland can come to terms with this very complicated trading arrangement that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world um, and that has been brought about in a vote that Northern Ireland didn't want in the first place. It's certainly not a, a blueprint for uh, the extension of, of peace, for sure. And one of the things that you will be doing during this project is looking to see if there are lessons from other countries that have been through um, war and peace and what and reunification um, or types of reunification that we could learn from on this island. What are you? What way are you going about those? Uh, investigations and have you spoken to anybody interesting so far what should we expect from from these these pieces of work from you it's um it's interesting i you know i'd be loath to compare countries too much to one another because obviously the politics is so different the geography so different the history so different but it does give us hints of lessons that we can learn or that we can um kind of take lead a lead from i think that's quite important um, Germany is obviously one that people mention a lot, the reunification of Germany, and I've spoken to a couple of German academics about how the reunif reunification process worked. Um, there are some really interesting, though there's like quite significant differences, there's some really interesting lessons about identity, about the economic situation in East Germany when those kind of protests came about, uh, calling for reunification in the 80s. And they're really, really interested, the, the identity one in particular, the identity of an, what it is to be East German, what it is to be West German, that still exists today, even among young people who never lived in, in, a, in a, a divided Germany. That's kind of a very interesting lesson when we look at identities in Northern Ireland. And the thing that really, um, uh, I suppose, instigated all of that was uh, wanting a better life, you know, and and that is an important lesson as well, that we need to kind of create a standard of living here for people, no matter what side of the border they're on. Um, and that might drive the debate or decide it at the end of the day. There are other examples, you know, people talk about federates, fed, uh, federation, a federate system um, that, that you could learn from as well about the practicalities of governing a region, you know, together. Um, Spain has mentioned uh, in that, that is, I suppose, good because, you know, when Ronan mentioned there that the right of Northern Ireland to, you know, um, govern their own, decide their own affairs, I mean, a fettered system kind of is an extension of that in a way. So those are all really interesting um, blue or blueprints, I suppose. But uh, as one German academic said, none of these are you know, the way to do it. We're not saying German reunif reunif reunification is the way to do it. We can only talk about our experiences, but we're not advocating things to be done this way because there were obviously problems with all all these kind of um, events as well. Of course, it's not just about this island. There's other parts of the UK, um, mostly Scotland, that this impacts as well pretty heavily. Um, if you have questions for the Good Information Project around this topic, if you have things that you would like us to make sure that we're touching on, um, there's loads of ways to get in touch with us. You can join our Facebook group, you can uh, WhatsApp us. All of those details will be 
everywhere that you see this video or hear the audio from this video. Um, and we've already been getting a lot of questions in from the audience. So we're just going to touch on some of the things that people have been asking us. Uh, Ronan, this is probably one for you from Irene Donegan. Um, you might be able to let us know if, if some of your work will cover this or if you can tell us the answer straight away. She asks, where is the All-Ireland Bill of Rights that was promised in the Good Friday Agreement? Yeah, that was one. That was one of the components that was in the Good Friday Agreement. In fact, it has its roots that goes back you know, much longer. And I think in the 1970s in Northern Ireland, it was suggested that some kind of a Bill of Rights be included to, um, I suppose, ensure mutual respect among communities um, in Northern Ireland. So that was an important part of the Good Friday Agreement, but it hasn't actually been implemented. Um, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission did come out with a report in like 10 years after that, so in 2008, governing some of these issues but it was never actually legislated for within law. Now, that's that can't happen sometimes, like, um, that things aren't legislated for in law. And it, it get kind of complicated in the sense that much of that was based on the, um, the ECH or the European Convention for Human Rights. The idea was that the Northern Ireland Bill, Bill of Rights would build on that. Now, and obviously with Brexit, things have kind of complicated itself there. In um, There's been a push within the UK for its own British Bill of Rights. And that was a kind of Conservative Party um, pledge over the last, I think, seven, eight years. So all these things have kind of converged to make the Northern Ireland Bill of Rights not happen. And um, we did see it um, come up in the Northern Ireland Protocol that Grania mentioned when she was speaking of Brexit. And one part of an element of it is that there would be no diminution of rights within Northern Ireland in that if they move away from, from the kind of ECHR and stuff like that. But the actual Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland hasn't actually been legislated for, even though it was, like I said, a component of the Good Friday Agreement. Something else that's coming up a lot, and quite obviously it's coming up a lot, is um, costs around a, a reunification, or as you mentioned, Grania there, um, how much this would impact people's standards of living either side of, of the border. Um, it's something that uh, one of our reporters has been tasked to, CJ McKinney, is looking at all of the economic reporting and modelling that has been done about a shared island and about reunification. So that'll be something that's coming in, in week two and week three of the Good Information Project. Um, Another uh, comment on Facebook from Sean Montgomery, and again, I think this will be for you, Grania, on the shared island unit. He wonders how the level of engagement with the DUP is on these types of topics. Yeah, um, if I could broaden that question out to unionists, not just the DUP, I suppose. The, the shared island unit have been in touch with, um, or have been in touch with unionist groups and have heard from them, which they said they found quite heartening was the word they used. Um, so there is a level of engagement, but I was reading a report, um, I think by the University of Liverpool, and it, it was talking about kind of discussions about United Ireland. And one of the things they said was, were, unionists said were, they were kind of hesitant about engaging with discussions about a United Ireland or a shared island because they're afraid that would entertain the idea or or give the impression that it was imminent, I think was, was the exact phrase they used. So that is a tricky part of this. Um, you know, there are two identities that in a way, in some ways are in conflict with one another. Um, but it is about, to, you know, even without that, if, they, if people don't come to you, you can go to other people and ask them, what are your views on this? There are ways around it. Um, that I think the shared island unit in particular are conscious of, because if this is going to happen or if you're going to have greater north-south cooperation, you do have to bring everyone along with you. Yeah, Marie Hannah Curran, one of our readers, in an email said the first step should be in realignment or alignment on shared issues. For example, tackling the housing crisis in both jurisdictions with the same plan, receiving the same outcome, a better housing policy. This would, of course, mean a shared pocket for the Irish government. Um, and a few things uh, like that are coming through from people. And I think especially in a pandemic um, situation where if you see there's kind of no success in, a, in two different plans on the same island. Ronan, something you're looking at as well, um, and this is again something that comes up probably more so than even cost, is a new name for the country, a new flag, a new anthem, moving a parliament to Belfast and rotating with Dublin, a new constitution, all of those things could be uh, happening in, a, in the 
Uh. All of those things could happen if reunification happens. One person says, though, they're okay with all of that, but we have to keep proportional representation in our voting. That's a red line. And when it comes to flags and anthems, do we know a lot about um, where those conversations could go or how we could come up with resolutions? Like you said, like these are particularly difficult issues, like powder keg issues. You usually use that term, but in this in this circumstance, it might necessarily be appropriate. But I, I think I was looking at, there was a report by the, the Oireachtas um, Committee on the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement, and they put together a large report based around these issues and reunification and looking at what it might like. And it was spelled out within that, that the idea of, you know, perhaps losing a flag or losing the anthem are issues that people in what's the Republic of Ireland would find it particularly difficult to perhaps concede, you might say, um, for a United Ireland. And it's kind of inarguable that that would be the case. And they would have to be something you would look at. But it's complicated in the sense that the easy answer would be to say, well, you know, well, if you come up with, um, well, not an easy answer, but one answer would be to come up and say, well, if there's an alternative flag, you know, if we could look at introducing another flag, like I know there's been work done in New Zealand on this. They wanted to move it away from a more colonial flag and to kind of introduce their own. So these are things to look at. But there are complications in that inherently in that the green, white and orange isn't going to disappear, for example, and it perhaps might be co-opted by what you might, you know, term as more hardline people. And that in itself could could lead to issues. So they're quite complicated things that have to be discussed ahead of perhaps any kind of um, meaningful vote on or meaningful discussions on any referendum. I think that's what part of these discussions and what kind of the shared island unit. I know it's not looking at those issues, but perhaps how it will branch into in, in the future. Yeah, because we have even two in the, in our week one, we have two very polar opposite messages coming through from two separate people. One saying, I will definitely vote no to a United Ireland if it meant any changes in our constitution, flag and anthem. And then someone else on the completely opposite side said, I have Protestant friends and a national anthem is something we should all be proud to sing and has meaning. If we are to have a United Ireland or a new Ireland, I want my Protestant friends to sing it proudly too. So it would have to be a new anthem. Oh, and one of the things you can add to that as well, is that we perhaps may have to have a new anthem, but there would also have to be an acknowledgement that currently, as it stands in Northern Ireland, people can have an Irish passport, they can have a British passport. Their right to identify in that way is enshrined in the Good Friday Agreement. So it is perhaps likely in this hypothetical scenario where there was a United Ireland or some kind of constitutional change that unionists would likely be able to identify as British in that situation. So... Um, in that sense, you know, that could be a way of, you know, perhaps meshing things in, in a way that is, you know, progressive in that manner, that they wouldn't necessarily be people, unionists wouldn't feel forced to give up something that that kind of idea of a shared identity would be preserved. That's kind of a lot of what we focused on so far. It's a lot of what the feedback we've gotten on the Good Information Project has been so far. We had a poll this week as well that also asked our audience how many of them had holidayed in Northern Ireland. Cross-border tourism is something that the government here and in Northern Ireland have, have always wanted to increase, but it's still we, we still have 40% of our readers who say they've never been to Northern Ireland on a holiday. So they're, they're still working in various things to make it even feel like an all-island sometimes. Um, What's next um, on your list, Gronia, to work on within this project? What, what are you seeking answers to? What are you, what are you investigating? The, the Taoiseach mentioned um, in his speech launching the Shared Island Unit that women, young people and new communities are quite marginalised or left out of the debate on the future of Northern Ireland, the, the, an all-island approach. And um, so I'm looking to speak to a couple of those groups, uh, um, including uh, a group of women a group that represents women in rural um, Ireland along the border. Um, so they are a group that Barnier met and he said they were quite impactful on his decision to prioritise Northern Ireland in the Brexit talks. Um, I'm also speaking to academics about healthcare on the island of Ireland. We're in the middle of a pandemic. You mentioned the, um, the idea of an all island approach to dealing with COVID-19. Um, uh, this week, a strategy has been launched to deal with an all island cancer research approach about clinical trials. So that is kind of an interesting topic um, about working together to improve 
the island's health, if you want to put it that way. Um, another topic I'm looking into. And then also um, following on from kind of the, the Brexit um, issues is the role of Scotland. Uh, there are elections uh, very shortly uh, that people will be watching very closely about how well the SNP do and anything that happens in Scotland will have ripples in Northern Ireland politically easily. So that will be closely watched about not just Northern Ireland's future, but the future of the UK. Yeah, for nationalists and unionists both. Uh, and Ronan, what's your focus for the next week or so? Well, I will be looking on those difficult issues we spoke about in relation to the flag and those kind of suggestions as to how we might progress discussions on that and how you would even broach such a subject. Um, another thing I will be looking at is kind of how civil society groups um, across the island of Ireland, so, you know, non-governmental groups, are perhaps thinking on an all-Ireland basis and with a specific focus on perhaps these groups that have um, the goal of a referendum. There's one prominent group called Ireland's Future, and it's been holding different online discussions about you know how these issues could play out, what it could look like, in an attempt to perhaps put pressure on the Irish government to look more seriously at the idea of a referendum and to begin the idea of preparing for that. One of the things they're particularly focused on at the moment is, you know, we spoke on the circumstances of when um, a referendum north and south could be held. You know, they want details about, it's within the gifts basically of the UK Secretary of State to call a referendum if they feel that such a re referendum would pass. Basically, at that point, the Secretary of State um, can call a referendum. But what we don't know, we don't have the idea of exactly what the Secretary of State will use to determine whether or not it passes. So we need more detail about that. Um, in terms of the civil society groups, groups, I was looking at a group called the Kayla, and I think people would might be familiar with that group, and they, they are opposed to the rise of you know far-right policies in Ireland and Far right groupings, and it's essentially an anti racism um, group that has you know been going over the last six months. And they recently introduced um, a group in Derry and in Belfast as well. So they're operating on an all Ireland basis on the issue of anti racism. So, how are they kind of operating in a way that's it's not necessarily about the national question, but it's about how a group can, can tackle the same issue north and south? Yeah, and how some, some organisations are ahead of others in, in that respect as well. And I, I found it fascinating even in the last few weeks seeing the, the level of coverage around things like the Shared Island Unit increasing across most media outlets. And this conversation being accelerated on a number of fronts because of Brexit, like we talked about, um, because of politics like the Sinn Féin ad in, in the US. Um, but there also just seems to be a natural uh, kind of shift in this conversation becoming much more of a reality. So yeah, it's, it's great for us that that conversation is happening. It's great that we're covering it here on the Good Information uh, Project. If you'd like to join us as we have this dialogue, you, there is loads of ways to do so. You can get us on our newsletter. You can sign up to that on the journal's homepage or at the end, the, site, the sign up boxes at the end of any of our articles. You can find our Facebook group. You can WhatsApp us. All of those links will be available to you where you are watching this. Um, we will also, the next time you see us, be with an expert panel. So people who are more learned than us talking about these issues um, like reunification in other countries um, the specific problems around Brexit and trade um, and other considerations um, if this island is ever to be a truly shared one so you can comment um, in any of those channels and um, you can talk to Brian our project manager through any of those channels and we will see you here hopefully next time thank you very much